Eternal and gracious Father. Yes, Lord. Right now, God, we come and pray, God, for these young soldiers, God. We, yes, we pray Lord. right now, God, for their protection. We pray right now for their mind, God. We pray right now, God, that you dispatch your angels around them, God, in the trenches, God, where they dwell every day, God. Let them know that they are valued, God. Let them know that they are important to us, God. Let them know, God, that they mean a lot to us, God. And let them know, God, they are men, God, and women in the community that love them, God, and yes. understand them, God. Yes. That don't ridicule them, that don't point the fingers, God. But just hear, God, and just give experience, strength, and hope, God. I ask, God, that all their dreams and all their aspirations, God, everything, God, that they have planned for their life, God, I ask that if it's in your will that you let it come true, God. I pray for them in Jesus' name. Ghetto is a state of mind. I don't think it's where you live. And I think that we can take our community, you know, and make it something to where you can enjoy, you know, living and raising a family. The east side of Buffalo, people try to depict it as a war zone. It's not. You got 1%, just like in any community that cause havoc, you know, throughout the neighborhoods, you know, in the cities, uh, throughout the whole United States. But there are still homeowners, you know, there are still people investing in businesses, you know, there are still community stakeholders. I've been around that neighborhood since I was 12. Even when tops came, you know, a lot of the corner stores couldn't compete, you know. So I watched it, but now I'm, I'm here also to see the renaissance of Jefferson as well. Yeah. What time is all the church? Uh, up here. You coming up here, Jeff? Yeah. Come on, we up in here. We want to see men that's engaged, you know, in, in getting out here in the community and letting people see that, that the men, you know, are actually actively getting involved in the safety and the protection and the nurturing of our children community for so long. It's been women, you know, for years it's been women. Like a lot of men was raised by their grandmother. You don't hear too many of us say we was raised by our grandfather. You know, we don't, you don't hear too many of us say that we were raised by our fathers. It's been the women at the helm. For a long time, you know, in the black community. So now it's time for the men to step up, you know, and be the head and not the tail. Yeah, the diet is very, very important. <laughs> don't even say that word, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mad Dad stands for Men Against Destruction, Defending Against Drugs and Social Disorder. That's what Mad Dad is. So anybody can be a mad dad. Young people, they're looking for guidance. They're looking for nurturing. They're looking for somebody to give them what they, you know, need. And that's just to simply care and give them affirmation, you know, and let them know that they mean something. And they want to, everybody want to be a part of something. You know how the Bible says, let your light so shine so they may see your good works. Right. When people see your good works and they know it's authentic, when there's authenticity about what you do, people gravitate toward that. They know it's not a gimmick. The only thing we want to do is give our children, give our men the opportunity to excel in life so that we can better our community. And so we can begin to build on what we already have. And that's love. Love is the foundation of everything we do. And nothing is more powerful than love. What you believe in? Actually, I'm a Muslim. I'm But you know, I let's go. respect, you know? Yeah, that's what's oh, yeah. No, 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 no. So explain the truth, Tawheed. The truth, yeah. Tawheed, was what? So, La ilaha illallah. What else? What happened, when, what happened when the Muslims went to the Christian king and begged for, uh, begged for amnesty because they was getting chased and about to get killed? He let them in. Why? Because he said that their he prophet said, was just like, mm -hmm. that's true, Tawheed. He said between... He said, this, he, he put a line, he said, this is the difference between mm -hmm. us. And it was nothing. nothing. Amen. Mm -hmm. So let us pray. Let's, let's get it something minor. Let's get it. Come on, y'all. Let's circle the, let's, let's, let's have, let's, let's show some unity. I'm also the chaplain at the East Ferry Detention Center. I'm the Buffalo Police Chaplain as well. And when I'm in the detention center, a lot of our young brothers say, if I only had a dad. That's meaningful to me. You know, because my father didn't raise me. And so I was in the streets. I was a dad. Uh, you know, I was 15. I got a girl pregnant at 14. Nobody told me about the birds, the bleeds, the flowers, other trees. You know, I had to find out the highway. I had to bump my head out when nobody was there to tell me, don't do that. Don't do this. Go to school. Go to college. Get your degree. Get a trade. Nobody said that. Rahman Rahim Kul. Allah my brother. <laughs> Good to see you, all right? You know what? Yeah, stay safe. Always, man. Y'all be easy, man. So, wait a minute. We ain't finished. We ain't finished. We ain't finished. We ain't finished. So, I'm the son of an addict. 
you know, um, thank God my mom got like 30 some uh, years clean. Now I've been on the street since I was 13 and I know why these kids are angry and I know why they worry and I know why they're afraid and I know why um, they can go from zero to a hundred because all they have is they self-respect now and nobody take that from them. You know, they want to be loved. You know what I'm saying? They want somebody that they can count on, you know? And I remember being homeless. I remember being afraid. I remember being scared. I remember being hungry. I know how that feel, you know? I know why I used to go to school early because I had to get breakfast. And I used to have to hang around breakfast because if you didn't want your donuts or your milk, whatever, I gotta put that in my book back. I gotta take that home. Yeah. So what we doing, y'all? We doing our mad dash, our street walk, you see? The brothers. We grew up down south, and everybody down south lived with their mom and their dad, you know. I, and we lived with our grandmother, so we was ridiculing. My grandma was a black Seminole and Irish, you know, so um, she was high yellow. And, you know, we used to get picked on and stuff all the time. We ain't had no mama, and we was foster kids, and, you know, and so we messed around and came up here like the summer of 84, and it was live break dancing, bombers, you know what I'm saying? LL Cool J, Run DMC. I mean, Buffalo was lit. And we went to, I went to the Perry Project, the Willow Park Project, the Town Guard, the Ella Kamar, the Frederick Douglass. So I'm thinking, I'm in the Bronx. I was wide open. You can't go back to no little rural town in Alabama after you spent the whole summer in Buffalo. And my mom was on, on her P's and Q's. You know what I'm saying? And she kept her fronts up, and we thought it was lovely up here, but little did we know that was a facade. When at one point, you know, my mother was evicted and so me and my brother had to find places to live. So I lost touch with him. He lost touch with me. We're here and there. We would find each other. But in the meantime, those years were very, very traumatic for us because we were just out here trying to make it, you know, just trying to live and survive. I couldn't handle being a mother at that time. And so my mother intervened. She came from Alabama and got my children, which they was only supposed to stay with her for 18 months. And it turned into 10 years. She just couldn't let them go. And she raised them and it was a blessing, a total blessing that she raised my children because I still was in a whole different world while they were living in Alabama. I was doing my own thing here in Buffalo. I was 17, 18, 19 years old. So, and um, I was an addict, I didn't care. I was trying to make some money. I didn't care who saw me. They weren't gonna stop me from making no money. I didn't care if it was my kids, my mother, I didn't care who it was. The turning point for me was in 1993 when I had been to detox about five times. And first I wasn't trying to get clean. I just was trying to stay away from the drugs for probably a period of a week or time or so. But then I was realizing that I, I didn't want to live like this. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm an embarrassment to my kids, to my sisters, my brother, my mother, you know, so I was sick and tired of living like that. So I asked God to help me, and he did. I'm not angry about anything because this was the path I had to go through. I had to go through this to make me the woman that I am today. I came up here, didn't have no support, and I went from the honor roll to the jelly roll overnight, you know? Um, and I started smoking weed, I started drinking, you know, uh, started selling drugs, doing what I had to do to survive, you know? And, um, and my crew, my team, they took good care of me. I was always the little, the little guy. They made sure I was all right, you know? You know, and then once I got a little bit older, you know, I started selling coke and I made sure everybody else was all right. His household was, you know, literally like the same. You know, um, both of our mothers were addicted. Their drug of choice back then was heroin and crack. And they both were out there. It was hard for both of us to actually deal with that reality. And our thing was sports. Basketball just stuck to us. So we used to walk the whole city and go to basketball courts and pick games and talk trash to every neighborhood. I was a monster back then. We was just killing everybody. We wound up becoming a part of um, AAU teams. With AAU teams, a lot of things had happened. You had to pay a little bit of money. They used to charge like $300 for out-of-town trips. We never went on any trips because we never had the money. We used to walk from one neighborhood, Cold Spring, to another neighborhood to act like we were going swimming 
to actually get clean. And we would have bars of soap in our pocket. You know, sometimes you would wash your clothes in there. And, some, and, and if it was a nice day, they would dry in a couple hours. When I say it was us, it was me, him, it was a few, a lot of us. It brings you closer together because you already know I'm hungry. I know you hungry, you know, but we had a spot called Gigi's on Ferry and Jefferson. And the lady there used to give out free food in the after, and you either get breakfast you, you, or you can get dinner, but you can't get all three meals, you know? So she knew us, so she, she always used to hit us off with food. I always had a way out. I had a scholarship, I was that good. My loyalty to others is something that, you know, my, just my loyalty to my neighborhood, my loyalty to the people that I rock with was so essential at that time because that's all I really had. When those cultures were gone, I had them. When those people wasn't around, I had them. When, I was, when it was time to eat, I ate with them. When it was time to actually get fed, we went out and got the food together. That's how we did it. So when we hustled, we hustled together. So my, com my camaraderie and my loyalty was to that genre of people at that time right there. That's who I cared about. That's who cared about me. So therefore, I cared about them. As we started to get older, responsibility started rearing its head. And we realized we needed to be self-sufficient some type of way. So we embarked on a journey of doing a whole lot of things to get paid for our selling drugs. We became involved in the gang activity. I wouldn't say it was gang. People call it gang activity now because of the way that it's set up, but it was just a bunch of neighborhoods back then. My mom was a street lady, you know what I'm saying? And me being popping in the neighborhood, she just, she just showed me the ropes. You know what I mean? She couldn't take care of me, so she showed me how to take care of myself. And, but she didn't want me out in the street smoking weed and stuff, because she didn't want me to get hurt. So she said, if you're gonna get high, get high at home. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna need some protection, hit this go. You know what I'm saying? Actually, her boyfriend gave me a little 22, you know, and um, when, it, when I started selling cocaine, she showed me how to bag it up. You know what I'm saying? And stuff like that. Showed me how to sell it. You know, and she was just showing me how, 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 to, how to survive in the streets because she was an addict. So she was a street lady. You know, she was a prostitute, you know. And, um, but now she's my hero. You know what I mean? And, and, and um, I, I really respect and love my mom, but we call hell. I was tired, you know. By the time I was 22, I had three kids. You know, um, being on the streets at 13, hustling and using and, you know, just being grown, I was, I was tired. But then I had about 15 of my friends that got murdered in the streets, not 15 people that I knew of, 15 of my comrades. You know, then my brother uh, went to prison on a 20-year uh, sentence and all my friends were going to prison and, you know, people were dying and I knew that I wasn't raised like that. You know what I'm saying? And I began to look at the community where I was raising, and I was looking around. We was destroying it. Like, we was, like, the way the east side of Buffalo looked, we destroyed our neighborhood. We did. You know, we turned neighborhoods into deserts. You know what I'm saying? Certain parts of Buffalo, you know, that were thriving communities, and we got out there and we hit that block, man. It was no holes bar. And so I just made up my mind that I couldn't do it because, remember, I was raised in Alabama. And as a child, I, was, I grew up in the church. I was the assistant superintendent of the church at 11 years old. I taught adult Sunday school at 11 years old, you know, so I knew right from wrong. You know, we were very well to do living with my grandmother, you know, my Aunt Eula Mae, you know, my Uncle Pete. I mean, there was a, a, a neighborhood of people that raised me and my sister. One night after binging, um, I just looked myself in the mirror and, and the tears wouldn't stop running down my eyes. And I knew that my grandmother didn't raise me like that. So by this time, my mother had seven years clean. And so right there at 1333 Jefferson, right on Jefferson and Utica, there was a place called Group Ministries. And uh, Ronnie Sessom was there, God rest his soul, Deacon Sessom and Kenny Smith and Pastor Arthur Boy. And I, I walked in there and um, when I walked in, they was like, oh, you Juanita's boy. And uh, they're like, how you doing? Because I never got bummy or raggedy or none of that. But I said, yo, I, I get high. And they all started laughing, stopped joking. And I showed them my thumbs from smoking uh, cocaine and blunts and the oil would get on your fingertips and it would turn brown like this color. I showed them I had been smoking all night. And so um, they was like, uh, well, we're going to get you in a program. So they called First Step in Niagara Falls and they said, but you got to blow numbers. I'm like, what do you mean blow numbers? They said, you got to be intoxicated. I said, I told you I ain't trying to use no more. So they bought me a little uh, quarter pint of Seagram's gin and a 40 bowl of 800 and they told me to drink it on my way going. So I did. But when I got there, the nurse at the window, I knocked on the window and she was like, um, what you want? And I was like, well, Deacon Sessom told me to come. She said, but what do you want, though? I said, well, they said y'all had a bad for She said, you can't come in here. Who you running from? I said, I'm not running from anything. She said, you must be on parole or you trying to stay out of jail. Somebody trying to kill you. I said, no, I'm just trying to get my life together. She said, you can't come in here. 
She said, but if you want to uh, uh, start, go next door to the city mission. So I had a Newport, my last little Newport, it was broke. So I had to fix my little cigarette. So I went outside and I lit it. And then I heard somebody say, yo, Kendu, that's you? I was like, oh, no. Nah. They know I'm a hype. And so um, it was Wardell one of my customers from the street. He said, what's going on with you? I was like, yo, man, I've been getting high. He was like, no. I was like, yeah, he was on the other side of the fence. So he said, a white dude just left, man. They got a bed open. I'm telling you, it's a bed open. Go right now. So I knocked on the window. And when this lady came back, her whole demeanor had changed. And she said, baby, you serious, ain't you? I said, yes, ma'am. If I go back out on the streets, I'm going to die. And she said, come on in. She said, but you only got one chance, right? And so uh, with that, you know, I signed myself in to detox for 28 days. The next morning I woke up, you know, and now we got to sit in this circle. And so I'm sitting in the circle and the first person start out, I'm an addict name. And they begin to tell their stories of addiction and how they hit rock bottom and how she sold her son, you know, uh, as a sex slave and how he lost his family and how he was a millionaire and this and all that. And so I'm looking and I'm like, these are the people who lives I helped destroy. But not only did I help destroy their life, now I'm one of them. And it had got to me and I had crocodile tears running out of my eyes and I was not going to say it. I was not going to say it. And they kept encouraging me to start standing around me. And um, I finally said it. My name is Kenny. I'm an addict. And the whole low came up off me when I admitted that I was a sick and suffering addict addicted to the drug and the lifestyle and uh, the rest is history. You know, I went there for 28 days and then I went to Stetsman's on the campus of uh, Buffalo State College for another uh, 30 days and then I came out and um, I, I've been on the front line fighting, you know, to help people get their life together ever since. You know, I had a few relapses, you know, during that time. I, go, I got over 20 years clean. My son, 22, I had 22 years clean from crack cocaine. And he knew from, from that that he that's not how he wanted to live. My children were trained up right by my mother. So he was trained correctly and he just realized that wasn't the way he wanted to live. But I thank God for Jesus because we were able to get out. A lot of people don't come out. I had started telling him about the Lord and he came to church and he came and he gave his life to the Lord. Good morning, good morning. You want to tell us come get yourself? I'll get it, girl. It's a lot of children that got mothers out here, you know, that's 35, you know what I'm saying? That's 28. You know, they in the condition at the end because that's our fault. We showed them how to use drugs, you know? We sold their parents drugs, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's my obligation to go back, but to also show them that God can change anybody. And so those people, if you notice on the block, people blow, riding by every other cop, well, I can't do it, what up, baby? And, you know, people walking up, they know my history, they know my past. You understand what I'm saying? And so I feel obligated and responsible for my community, like, for real, for real, to the point where sometimes make me sick, I had to go to the hospital, I'd be so stressed. I just know that I promised God if he would give me a shot at life, I wasn't going to let him down. So, so the energy that I get is from God, straight up, you know. The energy that I get is I give back freely what was not given to me, and that's love. Ten year uh, bidder. He was in the Bible study every day. I just want to you say hi to him. Hey, Chino, what's happening to you, man? How's it going, brother? How you doing? I'm doing real good, man. Let's, let's pray real quick. So eternal gracious Father, we just thank you right now, God, for your faithfulness. No in-between for us right now. There is no say. Like, we're out here doing uh, God's work, I believe. I, it's what he wants me to do. It's not about what I want to do anymore. I have my shot. Now I don't have a say. I am forced to do this work because everything that you have done, you better repent for it because, yo, you have to you have to honor him because you're going to, yo, I'm about to see him in a little while. Life is not long. Man, give me some money, man. I just, I just work hard for these kids because they need us. But one thing that we bring is that father figure because we're not going anywhere. And I'm not taking nothing from any other group, you know, because all the groups do phenomenal work. But our job, we engage men. Right? We engage men, we engage young men, and we're gonna be consistent. Yo, tell them to come on, man. We're gonna pray for my little homies, man. We don't ridicule, you know, our young men and our young women. We don't say you shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing that. And we never ask them what's wrong. You know, we always ask them what happened. 
Eternal gracious Father. Yes, Lord. Right now, God, we come and pray, God, for these young soldiers, God. We, yes. we pray right now, God, for their protection. When you get to the root of what happened, then the healing process could start because you know where to begin from. I know why these children are angry. You know, I know why they're sad, they're upset. I know why a lot of them have mental health issues, you know, and it all extenuated from their upbringing, you know, their situation at home and the lack of love. And if I could just take a little attention off of somebody, I know that they'll be a little bit better. Ever since, you know, he came out the street, he's really been trying to help heal the street and, and be a connection with, with um, especially young men to, you know, be a mentor to them. So now he has the mentor pro program, the Mad Dads, and it's just so much. And then since he works for the city of Buffalo in recreation, he's always around kids. On our team. Oh, you gonna jump on our team. Yo, we gonna need you to start praying for us, you heard? Yeah, hell yeah. No, no, big motherfucker here. Yo, see y'all boys in the hub. Be young with us. You have to be in the lives of these young brothers and young sisters, you know, because a lot of people, on the east side of Buffalo, our single parents, especially mothers. I'm gonna show you, Hazy. Come on, let's get these red worms. Like 90% of the young men that I met her come from single family homes with the mother. And she has a lot of other kids that she's trying to raise <laughs> and she's doing the best they can, so they need help. But when a person has a mentor, as a life coach, uh, uh, statistically, they excel in school. Uh, statistically, they graduate from high school. Statistically, they become productive members of the community because they have someone that's showing interest in their life and their well-being. All right, who's not in the water? So you got kids that have you know, major trauma you know, major trauma at young ages and at young ages. And then you have some that don't. You have some that just need to be around their own age groups, you know what I'm saying, and do things together because technology has dumbed them down. We took a whole bunch of kids fishing, gave them fishing poles, and made them interact with each other because they all came with different people from different neighborhoods. So we made a whole lot of kids who don't know each other know each other. So now the generative thing that's been happening with the hoods and how they're separated, these kids already get familiar with each other. Now we're going to make them, you know, the foundation. And they're, not, well, they are the foundation because there's way more kids than that. And we make them all be around each other and they become a family. Okay, I'm going to try to dig it out a little bit. And then yeah, we're there you go. Pull. That's thinking. All right, three, Hell, two, yeah. Like, Teamwork. Yeah, we did it. Teamwork. Now, oh check God. it out. So anything they do, field trips, whatever, no matter what we come up with, they all doing it together. Then they going back to their respective hoods. But now when they see each other, they greet each other a different way. It's not an opposition because most of them, if you don't, if I don't know you, you don't know me, you already are. You are opposition already. But in these situations, we can actually heal something before it even starts. You can actually fight the culture. You can fight the culture by helping the youth, and I don't think a lot of people know, know that. They don't put enough resources in there for them because they think that they're a lost cause. Stay come here. Listen to what he has to come say. here, man. Thank come you. on. You can't come be here. upset because it's time to go. Come on. Come on, man. Don't get mad. I told you, man. I told you about your attitude, and I told you about your anger. You're going to be all right, man. Everything is not going to go your way sometime. You came out here, man. We did that. We're going we gonna to be out here That's again. We'll be back we got week. three times a week, bro. Do not get mad, man. We all right, man. Do not okay. cry, bro. Come on, man. Oh, we got you, man. We gonna come back. We gonna come back, man. Reef, take care of your brother, man, all right? I love you, man. I'll see you later. I went to prison for murder in the second degree. I actually was in Rochester on Flint and Jefferson. I was actually born in Monroe County. I was actually born in Monroe County Jail. My mother had to do five years and I was given up for adoption at that point in time. Um, my family took me for a little while, but like I said, it was a whole lot of people, a whole lot of different situations. I wound up getting sent to Buffalo. When I got sent to Buffalo, I was like maybe four years old, five years old, um, and I stayed and I wound up staying. Here's the dynamic of true social disorder. When you're so used to chaos, but when you go somewhere else around different people, they still seem familiar. It's a dude just like him. We on Jefferson in Flint. It's a dude just like him on Jefferson and Riley. They all seemed so familiar, so it was easy fitting in. In the course of that, I, I stepped it up as far as my, you know, my, my grind, as far as my money, because I had a kid. 
So my kid, so I'm like, yo, my kid about to have everything. I'm about to do this for real. So I wind up getting a job at Burger King and flipping my checks and getting out on that block and I was hustling hard in Rochester. One day we on the corner and I got this person that comes by and buy drugs from me on a regular basis and we were massively cool. And she was like, um, I'll be back in another hour. I want, so I was like, I bet I got you. I'm gonna be right here. But when I came back, it was somebody else that was at that car. Me and that person got into an altercation. And I said, yo, you know, that's my lip. You know, if I say, you know, that's my people's, I don't, I don't sell to your people, don't sell to mine. You know, he was like, yo, well, it is what it is. You no, know, you ain't from here anyway. You know, here we go, the audience, ooh. Oh, all right, well, I'll tell you what. Do it again, we're gonna have a problem. Oh, word, yeah, word, that's my word. We're gonna have a problem, you do it again. All right, all right, we can go our separate ways. When you do that in the hood, you put your word on something. You better stand by that or you're going to be lunch meat. He did it. And I seen him. And I ran up on him. I said, yo, what's up? I said, what's your problem, bro? As soon as I did that, he pulled out a gun and started shooting at me. And I pulled out a gun and started shooting at him. Mind you, you got teenagers with weapons, no training, know anything about firearms but what they see on TV. And we shooting these guns in the middle of the street. And I hit somebody that had nothing to do with the altercation and they wind up passing away. And I live with that every single day. I sleep, I eat, it'll cross my mind so much because not just me doing the prison time because that was by my hand. I don't think anybody understands that type of torment or pain that you know you can administer on yourself because I'm my worst critic. So here it is, I know I went to jail damn near a kid. Everybody thought I was a man. Mentally, I was a damn kid with no type of stability, with no type of standards, no type of morals. I had morals and principles, but they came from a wrong place. The block was my mother and the, and the hustle was my father. A dude came to me one time. I was in um, Elmira reception. And I just got there and we all shackled up and we came in. And the same person that I had a problem with in Buffalo when I left is the first person I seen when I came up. And he was behind the fence. And he said, y'all can't wait to see you in prison. I'm gonna murder you. I was like, yeah, I am gonna murder you. You ain't said nothing. Nah, nah. Here's the thing about those type of words and the what and the way the narrative is played out. These people will hype you up so much that you even start believing your own narrative. You believe the dominant narrative that they put out there because you like, yo, man, if I'm up here for it, I got to rep it because, man, that's what these dudes respect in here. So if you're not careful, you will warp yourself and become pretty more violent than you were when you came in because you're going to get tried from the time you step in there. My 27 years in prison, I've been stabbed 21 times. My earlobe was cut in half, man. I've been sliced. I've, I've been beat up by officers. I went through it all, man. I even got the walk to prove it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He destroyed my leg. I know for a fact that these guys that are out here perpetuating violence, they're not ready for it. It's a whole nother dynamic, a whole nother world that you can't even phantom. We got a saying in the day that says, man, signs are there for those who reflect. So that means that you got to pay attention to everything that's happening. So I've seen everybody dying in my family, especially the men. I lost all my uncles. I um, came to a conclusion that I had to have a purpose. And uh, I had to live for my brother. And I had to live for my other little, you know, my other little partners that was getting, you know, down down here. And I had, I had a purpose and I was doing it in jail. I started writing crazy. I always was a writer. I published a book and I became a bestseller in three days from prison. And everybody was going online like, yo, yo, Tubbs book is on Amazon. And so I kept writing. So I wrote a play. It was on after that. So then I started a 90 day ceasefire. Nobody fighting, nobody getting cut, stabbed, nothing. So I started doing, I was like, yo, I can do this. So I started really doing it. I, I met this lady, she was bringing a program in there called AVP. It's alternative to violence program. And they came, they ran workshops. So they bombarded you with tools to be nonviolent. I took a vow of nonviolence against any and everything. Nobody's gonna bring me out of my zone. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes it, you came so close. It was a, a real big thing to put on yourself. It was massively weird to be in that place and trying to be that way.
as you start getting older, when you start starting to see the, you know, the elements of what you put forth into the world, you're like, yo, wait a minute, did I aid it or did I hurt it? You know, did I did I hurt my community? What did I do? Did I huh? You thought you was doing all of this good. You was helping all of these people financially when you had money, or you was out here young and you out here wild and you out here doing this and your name is known and you respect it. But what are you doing directly? Not just to your community, to yourself. What are you doing? Not just to yourself, to your family. What are you doing? Not just to your family, man, but to the children that's gonna follow behind them, your grandchildren, so on and so on. This is what we're suffering now. You know, we're reaping the we're reaping the um, bad decision moments and having them play themselves out right in front of you. So it's like one big movie. There is no excuse for what I did. There's no excuse for what anybody has done, you know, because when it comes down to it, man, you still have to make rational decisions, even in, you know, in harsh situations. That's what make people great. That's what make people great. But I am trying to prove that um, you can be great no matter what you do. You know, and no matter what has taken place, I'm on the road for to redeem, redeeming myself because I worked on it so hard there. I'll be damned if I come out here and just give up everything for that battle. Yeah. No, I'm here for you, bro. If you want to talk, you know, I'm always around, bro. All ears. All ears and shoulders, bro. All ears, Xander, man. All ears. So my drive is not just my own family, but others, plus the people that you've met along the way, because I don't have just my two daughters I got a million kids across this city you let me tell it because of our relationships and who we are to each other I'm a person that can actually walk up to them and see them doing something in the street and stop them from doing it just on that respect alone and I cherish that I was at that Juneteenth man and every time they seen me they stop and so yo if the world carries on and people find out who you are now they want to know who you are why why do these kids like you so much who are you you know, what's good? Yeah, I'm coming to this pro. I want to see what you're about. So now they're going to be there and be grenades. They're going to test you the whole time they're there. Be bad as a mug. Just act up. But you just can't give it to them. You be, you be, you be as kind as you possibly can and lay that affirmative action thing out the best way you can and say, this is what we're doing. Everybody that's here, man, we structured this on a whole lot of different virtues, man. And, um... Most of the virtues that we focus more on, we focus more on fairness, because we want to be fair to each other. We focus more on truth, because we always say what goes on here stays in. You know, we do. So you're establishing a constitution with some kids already. Your constitution is set. That's everybody got to abide by that. So anybody that's not abiding by that look really, really weird, because you ask them, yo, what's special to you? What is a moral or a principle that you live by? Well, what's a moral? <laughs> what's a principle? No snitching. <laughs> <You're> like, whoa. <laughs> what do you want from other people? Respect. You know, write respect down, put it in the middle of the floor. By the time you're done, you got paper plates everywhere, all these words. Courage, dependability, one speak at a time, hygiene. All this stuff is on the floor. We all agree to this as, as, as a people. We all agree to this? Yeah, yeah, well, we agree. Cause it all came from them. Once you remind them of everything they put down there, man, you got your constitution back. So it's what you give them. If you give them courage and you give them respect, because now you got to keep two for yourself. Hey, yo, I need to add, I need to add two in here. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Ask their permission. All right. So I'm gonna put responsibility and something else in there as my two, and I'm gonna roll with that. And I'm a part. Can I be a part? Yeah. I don't, yeah. Now we good. So it's just not you being over them. It's you being a part of them. Clap. Come on, next hand, yeah. Come on. Clap, clap, clap. Come on. Yes, you can. Stop saying you can't. That's a word we don't use. Look, same hand. You know, I was in jail for 20, 26 years. You know, yeah, 26 years. And um, when he came home, you know, he came right to me, you know, so. I was able to get some doors open for him that he couldn't get open for himself. And he excelled, you know what I'm saying? And I'm real proud of Tubbs, you know, but I can count on him. Now I got Tubbs with Pastor Giles. He has full-time employment with Back to Basics. You know, he made good money. You know, he able to take care of his family. And you know, the doors that, you know, they did not let him go through because of his, you know, past history, him connecting with me you know, um, and people, you know, having confidence in my judgment allowed Tubbs to, you know, be able to speak for himself. All he needed was the audience. And once you listen to him, it's all you need.
You know what I mean? You're going to know that he's a pure person and his motives are, are, are righteous. You know what I'm saying? He's going to, I expect big things out of tubs, big things out of tubs. I used to sell crack cocaine on this street. Like right across the street, AC, God rest his soul, you know, was one of our biggest customers. We used to hustle out of his house. We used to hustle on the corner. We had a house on Waverly, a house on Purdy, and we used to sell dope on this street. And that's what's so crazy. Now I'm a pastor on the street where I should come and drop cocaine off on this street. She said, no, she said outside. You got the freezies? Yeah. Oh, dairy farm? When you gonna come visit me at, at the church? I don't too much go to church or nothing like that. Well, come visit. I'm the pastor of this church. You ain't no Are you Pastor Kenny? That's me. That You know my dad, David. That's your dad? Yeah. David Muhammad? Yeah. You look just like him, too. <laughs> Thank you. For real? Why well, I ain't never seen you? I live in that yellow house. One Sunday, that's why he was, he was over there. Yeah. yeah, he was over there. He said, Heidi, I was standing there. Yeah, so you go, no, that's, that's you. you. Oh, when you need you. some more. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a neighborhood that me and my brother, a lot of our team destroyed. And now to be here, you know, um, here and now, you know, they ain't hustling on the block no more. You know, they respect what we're trying to do. Father, we are putting forth catalysts of change in this evening, dear Lord Heavenly Father. Buffalo, New York will never be the same, dear Lord Heavenly Father. The lives that was taken was a message to the city of Buffalo on tonight that we need change, Father God. That's my tops. Like I said, Jefferson, that's, that's my neighborhood. I'm from Cold Springs. And when it happened, my phone was blowing up because that day that it happened, I was in Pittsburgh and everybody was calling my phone to make sure I wasn't there because I frequent that top. Sometimes we just go hang out in the parking lot and just kick it. A lot of pastors and deacons, I mean, it's like a gathering place, you know what I'm saying? And it affected us, you know, mentally because somebody came into our neighborhood and did that. And so we were offended. You know what I'm saying? I mean, pissed off that, that you stayed all the way in Broome County, where you're from, and you targeted this, this neighborhood, but you targeted older people. See, you wasn't going to come to Tops, you know what I'm saying, on a day. You sat there and you waited till you knew wasn't going to be no thugs, wasn't going to be no homies, wasn't going to be no potential backlash, you know? So it was a cowardly act, right? And so it made us angry. You know, it made the church angry. It kind of made a lot of people stop, stop liking white people, period. It kind of brought some racism, you know what I'm saying, into play because now we're looking at everything white ain't right. When you coming through our neighborhood, everybody looking at, yo, there go a white person, yo, watch them. You know what I'm saying? When that wasn't the case before. And, and also, you know, it made us aware that sometimes we, we, we're too welcoming. You know what I'm saying? You will kill your brother. You know what I'm saying? You'll shoot your brother, stab your brother. But any other ethnicity, you're welcomed. You know what I mean? We couldn't just go into South Buffalo, even right now, in certain parts of South Buffalo, and just sit at one of the grocery stores and have a conversation with anybody. They're going to be looking at you like the police will be done rolled up on you and ask you, what you doing here? Why are you still here? I think it's time for you to go. And the residents who come blatantly say, yo, why are you here? And so that, 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 that made us angry. But what it did, it brought our community to an awareness that we got to stick together. You know what I'm saying? We can't be hunting each other if we're being hunted. That we got to get it together. Not that, you know, uh, uh, we got to hate white people, whatever, but we got to begin to think about our livelihood as a people, too. We got to think about how we got to be unified and more aware. He's a As a pastor, I was pissed, and I had a lot of people calling me like, yo, Ken, do what you going to do? They wasn't calling me Pastor Ken. They was like, yo, Ken, do what we going to do? You know what I'm saying? And me being a pastor now, what we going to, first of all, we going to love on each other, and we going to show, because of this incident, how important it is for us as black people to stick together, you know, and stop killing each other, you know, and stop tearing each other down, but to come together, you know what I'm saying, as a people to uplift and strengthen. You know what I mean? You could tell me about the Lord, but right now my situation, I'm in dire straits right now. How can you help me? You know, uh, people can uh, deal with faith by what they say, but like James said, I'll show you my faith by what I do. This is what God said, what you do for the least of these, my brethren, you do for me also, you know? And I believe that wholeheartedly.